This is our second week of celebrating Advent, which is the coming. We celebrate the coming of Christ the first time. Uh, also, the, uh, the second time when he came here and the third time when he's coming back. So we all, we're all constantly celebrating the coming of Jesus. So, but it just so happens we set aside a specific time each year. As a lot of, we're not liturgical by nature, but, but <laughs> you have to, I know, Google the word. I realize that. Uh, but we're not normally, but we, we love Advent season. So this is our second week. Uh, we have had a topic last week, the eternal nature of Jesus. All these will tie together, as most topics do when it pertains to Christ. But this one, this week, is the righteousness of Jesus. And you probably noticed that from our Advent candle lighting. But a layman's definition, if you'll go there, a layman's definition of righteousness is simply put... Right standing with God. That's righteousness. So it's important that we understand, because we read it in the Scripture all the time, righteousness is the condition of being in right relationship with God the Father, with the Lord. And this can only happen, I'm going to be very repetitive today, but it's important that we get this, this can only happen through total faith and dependence upon Jesus the Christ. That's the only way right standing with God can happen. We have other ideas and we try to apply other ideas, but that's the only way that there is no other way. Jesus said it clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was pretty concise. You know, it's hard to, you can change it if you want, but you'd be changing what he said. There is nothing we can work out. There is nothing we can work for to obtain right relationship with the Lord. And you can read about that in Romans eleven six. Now, I know some of you immediately thought, well, wait a minute. Doesn't Philippians 2 teach us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Yes, that specific uh, scripture says that. But if you put it back in the context that, and you read all of that around there, it's work out your maturity, the, uh, your salvation to maturity by letting God work through you. So you got to read that whole, that you can't just take out a little scripture. You know, if we did that, we would all be driving Hondas. Why, why is that? Because they were all in one accord. I mean, that, we'd be following scripture, right? right. We'd, live, we'd live in another state. Noah looked out of the Arkansas. So... You, you know, you can't take, so you got to read that whole. So you cannot, there's nothing you could do to work out or work for anything to obtain right relationship with the Lord. Righteousness. One of the things that keeps us from truly understanding righteousness is the confusion about how we become right in the sight of God. How do we become right? How do we have rightness or righteousness in the sight of God? It's commonly thought, and some of us in this room still hold on to this premise, it's commonly thought that our actions are the determining factor in God's judgment of our righteousness. We do it every day, all day long, every day. That is not true. It's not true. There is a correlation between righteousness and your actions. Uh, yes, our right standing with God, uh, there is a correlation, but right relationship with God produces the right actions. It's not the other way around. It's not the, the, the we are not made righteous by what we do. We do because we're righteous. Now, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail in that, but righteousness is a gift that comes from the Lord to those who accept what Jesus has done for them by faith. Romans 5, 17 and 18. The gift of salvation produces a changed heart, mind, heart, body, produces a changed heart. In turn, that changes our actions. Actions cannot, do not, never have been able to change our hearts. Never. That, that's... Uh, they just have, it's the heart of man that God looks on in the first place. We learned that way back in 1 Samuel 16, 7. And we have to be righteous in our hearts to even worship God as we did here this morning. If it's just coming out of our mouths, it's not worship. It's got to come from your heart. John 4, 24 tells you about that. The mistake of thinking that doing right makes us right is the same error that the Pharisees made. 
And then they, they took all the laws and they added like 600 more. I don't remember exactly, but they just kept adding laws because they felt, well, if you do right, <laughs> that's a song by the, the rabbit, isn't it? Hey, I'm going to do right. Uh, if you do right, <laughs> that'll make you right. And that, that's not the truth. Religion, I know, that you've got to get it out because it's going to come out anyway. All right? Religion has always preached, if you check history, and well, even today, religion has always preached that if we clean up our actions, if you clean up your act, as we say, our hearts will become clean too. And wrong. Do not collect gold. Do not collect $200. Jesus taught the exact opposite. You can read about that in Matthew 23, 25, and 26. It's through a changed heart that our actions change. The heart is the issue. Actions are only an indication of what's already in our heart. We act upon what's already in us. Actions are the fruit of if you will, that the heart produces. This is the only avenue that will change anybody, including anybody in our culture. It's a heart issue. The problems we see about on the news, we hear about every day, our problems are heart issues. That's the problem. We can debate it back and forth all day long, but it goes to the heart. Modern-day Christianity often puts the emphasis on actions instead of issues of the heart. We do it all the time. This is reflected in our excessive efforts to legislate change in people's actions instead of changing their hearts by presenting them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We try to legislate. That's not going to change. Legislation doesn't change anybody. It's the gospel that contains the power of God, not legislation number 824 slash B, section 2. It's John 3, 16. That's what changes hearts. Not political action groups, Romans 11, I'm sorry, Romans 1, 16. Laws only confront actions. That's all laws do. Can, the gospel changes hearts. Once hearts are changed, that's when actions change. Contrary to popular belief, Christianity does not promise receiving justice from the Lord. That's not what Christ, that's not what this the Lord has a much better plan than that. And I'm glad he does. My son and daughter-in-law are professional photographers, and I'm sure they hear people say things like this all the time. Well, this picture just doesn't do me justice. I've heard people say that. And I look at the picture and I think, well, you don't need justice. You need mercy. <laughs> but that's the way it is with the gospel. We think we need justice, and we cry for justice, and that's, that's what we think we need. We don't need justice. We need mercy, mercy. This is the way it is with God. We call for justice. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. That's everybody. We've gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of of us all. Romans 3.23 and 3.10, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The wonderful plan of salvation is that those who put their faith in Jesus and what he did for us get, we receive what he deserves. We receive what he deserves. When we do not put our faith uh, in uh, total faith in Christ and his righteousness, then we will ultimately get what we deserve. And that's not good. We want to get what he deserves. Religion has subtly instructed us to trust in our own goodness instead of God's goodness, and this will never ever work. It's never work. That's why it took thousands of years for this plan to come into effect because we're so hard-headed. We are. You know that about yourself. We needed thousands of years for God to prove, repeat over and over again, we, we're not righteous. It'll never work on our own. We, we need that. That's why we repeat things to ourselves even. 
because we need that. You know, we're calling for our grandkids. Bill, Bob, Joe, Mary, Jim, whatever your name is. Because we don't, it doesn't absorb. Just the example of the song earlier. We're just faulty. That's the way we are. It, our goodness will never ever work. God's righteousness is always more in quantity and quality than ours could ever possibly be. Isaiah 64, 6 communicates that. Our righteousness is as filthy rags compared to God's. Well, someone, someone has told me this before, and someone might be thinking here today, well, that's not fair. Duh. But that's the way it is. God's righteousness is the standard by which everyone is measured. God's righteousness. How can anyone be saved then, Pastor Jerry? If that's the case, if I'm measured by perfection, then how can I possibly, possibly be saved? And the answer to that is you cannot be. No one can be saved if they are trusting in their own right standing with God, in their own righteousness. It can happen. It'll never happen. You cannot be saved that way. We all must have a righteousness that exceeds anything we could ever produce through our own efforts, and that's where the advent comes. That's where God in the flesh comes. That's where Jesus enters the picture. Glory to God. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Jesus was and is in right relationship with God as no one else can possibly be. And we talked about this last week. He's the eternal son of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. Uh, he is holy and pure without sin, yet he became sin for us. Through no wrongdoing on his own, he took our sin in his own body on the cross. I've got all the scriptural references listed for you in your bulletin. You can look them up. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We just use that scripture in prayer. In return for Jesus taking our sin, those who put their faith in him receive or get the opportunity to receive his righteousness instead of their own. Wow, really? Yes, really, his righteousness instead of our own. It is not our actions that make us acceptable to the Father. It is not our actions that make us acceptable to God. It's our trust in Jesus that imparts the righteousness of Jesus into our born-again spirits, into our hearts that gives us and makes us in right standing with God. If you really get that, the pressure's off. The pressure is off. That's why Jesus said you can have peace and joy and contentment and happiness. The pressure's off. I don't care what anybody says to you. If you under, really understand this, there's no pressure. Wow. It's His righteousness. In return for Jesus taking our sin, we get his righteousness. It's our trust in Jesus. Those who don't understand this righteousness I'm talking about, this right standing with God, which comes from God as a gift, those who don't understand that become frustrated trying to establish their own righteousness through good works, Romans 10.3. You say, wait a minute, I don't know if I... Think about your life. Think about the things you do. Think about what you're used to. Well, if I do this, it'll please my father. If I don't do this, then he won't accept me and I won't be pleased by him. We've lived this way our entire lives. That's not how it works in this relationship with God. It's not about what we can do. It's about what's already been done. Glory to God. How could you not shout and spit like that? <laughs> Sorry, Josh. <laughs> That's so why I got this little thing here. Ew. <laughs> Baptism. <laughs> but none of our own righteousness is not 
work. We have to trust completely in what Jesus did. We have to, uh, to obtain right relationship with God. It's the only way it works. Any trust in our own goodness, no matter how good you may think you are, any trust in our own goodness will void the atonement Christ made for us. It, it, null and void, Galatians 5, 4 tells you about that. This is precisely the condition of millions upon millions of people in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about in the body of Christ today. They receive salvation by putting their total faith in Christ uh, for the forgiveness of their sins, but then they return to believing uh, through various means that the Lord still relates to them on basis of their works or their actions even after they're saved. They returned to their condition before they were saved. Colossians 2, 6, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord by faith, trusting in what he did, so walk in him. Walk in that by faith. Since you were saved by putting faith in God's grace alone, then you maintain this relationship in the same exact way. And I so, know some of us sang that song when we were born again, just as I am. Remember that? And Billy Graham used to use that in a lot of his crusades and, and such a true uh, statement. But we sang that before we accepted Christ, just as I am. When well, we need to keep singing it. We need to sing this song all the way through our Christian lives until we meet him in the air, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. It's his work. Failure to understand this truth, I hope you get this, failure to really understand this is at the root of all guilt and all condemnation. Because I know many of you here just beat yourself up every day. I'm such a rotten Christian. Can't believe I said that to her. Can't believe I did that to him. Not understanding that you have the righteousness of Jesus in you produces guilt and condemnation. And I'm here to let you know that Satan's only inroad into your life is sin. That's his only inroad. That's his only door. It's sin. And he bore does he use it. If we understand our right standing with God on the basis of what Jesus did for us, his right standing, his righteousness, not by our own actions, then Satan's power to condemn you is gone. It's gone. There is no condemnation to those who are following Christ Jesus. Because we understand it's not our righteousness. If he's, got, if he's got something to say to you, you take it up with the boss. You got an issue with me, you got an issue with the righteousness of Christ in me. Condemnation is gone. Those of us who live with a feeling of unworthiness are not trusting that we have within us God's righteousness. It's Jesus. We are looking to our own actions to obtain right standing with God. It don't work. It don't work. It don't work. Remember the, at the drive-in, they had that mosquito commercial. It would break. It was a black and white thing, and they'd show mosquitoes trying to bite you, and that was the slogan. Don't believe it. It don't work. Well, actions don't work. Works don't work. You can't work it out. You can't work for it. The truth of the matter is, uh, on our own and by our own efforts, there's no way we could, could possibly be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And we're instructed to be that. We're instructed to be holy as he is holy. There's no way on our own we can do that. That's not only improbable, it is impossible. We have a problem, and it's called sin. And we are born with it, and we cannot overcome the effects of it in our lives on our own. Sin radically affects us to our core. It affects what we do. It affects what we say and think. It taints everything about us. Therefore, no matter how good we try to be, we will never meet God's standard of perfection on our own. That's why Jesus lived a perfect life. The only one who ever could or would as far as that goes. 
lived a perfect life, full obedience to the law of God in thought, in word, and in deed. Jesus' mission wasn't simply just to die on the cross for our sins, but it was also to live a life of right standing with God, of righteousness, to, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. He had to be sinless. Because if any one of us here were nailed on the cross, it's not going to affect anybody's life. We might be sad for you and might say, ooh, I bet that hurt. But it's not going to have any other effect. Perfection is what it takes. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 3, 21 through 22, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Through our faith in Christ, the righteousness of God is given to us. This is if you've heard the frame of the frame word, the word uh, imputed, if you've heard the, and understand the framework of that word, imputed righteousness, to impute something is to ascribe or attribute something to someone. So we have imputed righteousness. When we place our faith in Jesus the Christ, God ascribes the perfect righteousness of Christ to our account so that we become perfect in his sight. I know that's hard to believe, but if you've ever been a grandfather, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, he's just a boy. <laughs> She's just a girl. Your grandbabies don't sin. They're just kids. They're perfect in your sight. Come on, that's the truth. Now, if they do sin, there's some adjustment. Because if a grandpa thinks his, his grandson's sinning, he needs some adjustment. <laughs> Not the kid, the grandpa. <laughs> and that's the way it is with God. He, he does not see that about us. He sees us as perfect. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the right righteousness in right standing with God, that we might become that. Not only is Christ's righteousness imputed to us through our faith, but our sin then is imputed to Christ. That's how it works. It's an imputation party going on. I know that's not a very good t-shirt, but that's, that's what's going on. This is how Christ paid our sin debt to God. He had no sin, he was perfect, but our sin was imputed to him, ascribed to him, so he suffers on the cross, which makes his suffering the just penalty that the sin that's been imputed on him deserves. We deserve that. That's what we deserve. But we don't get what we deserve. We get what he deserves. His righteousness. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by, the faith, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What if, what if you really believed 100% that God is for you? What if you really believe that? 100% God is for you. What if we all really and truly believed and applied that God not only accepts us, but he accepts us fully because of the perfect person and the work of his son? It's not, not hard to trust in that, hard to trust in this. But it's not hard to trust in that if we really comprehend it. What if we sincerely believe that our best successes can't earn us any more access to God and our worst failures cannot take any of it away? You can't be good enough to go to heaven any more than you could be bad enough to go to hell. What if we really believe that? We can and we must believe and accept that. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are dealing with God's acceptance of us into right relationship with him. This is called justification. You've heard that word. And justification is by faith alone. There's a long road for us to get to, to understanding that. Justification deals with how we get right with God. Well, we found out we can get right with God. Because of who we are. 
We can't do it on our own. This is the, it's like, here's the setting. It's, it's a court of law, okay? There's a defendant, us, you, okay? And then there's a judge, God. And we're all rightly charged. We are guilty as sin, rightly charged with unrighteousness. That's the charge. A treasonous offense against Excuse me, the judge himself, not just against the law, but against the judge himself. We are guilty. Well, to be justified means that the judge declares you righteous rather than guilty. It means to be cleared of any wrongdoing. And the remarkable thing, according to the gospel of Jesus, the remarkable thing that it is even though we truly are guilty, God justifies the ungodly. Good grief, Charlie Brown. He justifies the ungodly through faith, as in Romans 4, 5. It's through faith. On what basis, though, does God declare us righteous? God's full acceptance of us is owing to the righteousness of another. Oh, Jesus the Christ, 1 John 2, 1. We are declared righteous and fully accepted by God, not on the basis of any rightness in us, but only through faith, looking outside of ourselves and then joining us uh, to a righteousness not of our own doing. Jesus is our right standing with God. If you'll get that. Sometimes it takes a lifetime to get that. But if you will get that, the peace that happens in your life, not just for you, but all those around you who have been putting up with you condemning yourself for 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, all those around you who keep listening to you say you love Jesus, but you can't seem to get a hold of, of why you can't live like you love Jesus. If you'll just get this, justification by faith alone is the heart of the gospel. Martin Luther called it the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. And those who most deeply hold to justification by faith, I have to tell you, become the world's freest people. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is liberty. We become the greatest doers our actions. We become the greatest lovers of Christ. All because we have found a greater and deeper capacity and potential for joy. Why? It's not my righteousness. Never has been, never will be. It is the righteousness of Christ. We cannot be truly content until we fully know and live out that God's acceptance of us is totally based on Jesus. Man. I, man. I just want to drop the mic. Well, maybe not walk like that. That was a little parapolitic, but Ephesians 3. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness was come, which comes from God on the basis of faith. Joy, contentment, peace in God. All these things are indivisibly linked to justification by faith alone. And it's good news. This is the good news. The surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. You can fully enjoy that apart from being, uh, uh, well, you can't, I should say you cannot fully enjoy that apart from being joined to Jesus by faith and then having his righteousness, which far surpasses our own. That's how it works. Again, I repeat this constantly, but again, I must remind you, it's a stacked deck. If we just join the game that God's laid out, you win as soon as you start. You win. You are more than a conqueror through Christ our Lord. Remember, I hope you remember this. I got to tell you because it's on my mind. But what more than a conqueror is? There's a prize fighter in the ring. He's fighting. He's fought twelve rounds. He gets pummeled. Uh, but he's finally declared the victor. He's, he's, he's a conqueror. Well, when he's done afterwards, his wife comes to the dressing room and he hands her the check. She's more than a conqueror. That's us. We get the check. 
He, he took the pummeling. We get the check. We are more than conquerors. God accepts us on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus. So I would just encourage you, settle that once and for all in your heart, in your mind, in your life. Settle that once and for all. Be done with it. You will not ever be good enough to provide a righteousness of your own that could be the grounds for your justification. It's not going to happen. Either Christ will be your righteousness or you will perish in your own. Settle that once and for all. And when you have settled this with God and trusted Christ for righteousness, then by that same faith, you will be able to regard Jesus as supreme in your life and you will break the roots of sin in your life through that process. Fight the fight. Fight the good fight of faith, not in order to be justified. Fight the good fight because you are justified with the righteousness of of Jesus. Musicians, if you'll come back. Please bow your heads with me. Out of respect for what the Holy Spirit's doing here this morning, let us with, continue our Advent season with confidence in the fact that there was a baby born who had and continues to have right standing with God. His righteousness is so true and perfect that it can change our hearts if we will allow it. What child is this? This is the eternal Son of God who for our sake was made to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen.